Those are, oh. This conference will now oh. be recorded. Okay. All right, guys. So the next um, the next presentation that we're doing has to do with public contact training. So in this job, you'll interact with the public, um, obviously, like pretty extensively. So it's important um, that you be prepared for that. Some um, of the protocols this year are specific to COVID-19, of course. Um, like everything, it's, um, it's changed how we do our work. So some COVID-specific things to have in mind are to always have a mask handy for when you're approaching people, houses, businesses, or also to, um, it's good to have it on hand if um, not on your face at all times. It's good to have it on hand for when um, the public, any anybody from the public might approach you. And we, uh, you're welcome to use your own, um, and we also do provide those as well if you need. So, of course, uh, be sure to maintain the social distancing of six feet from any members of the public. Um, ideally, of course, anybody outside of your household, you should be keeping six feet distance from as well. So this year, you are allowed to knock on doors. Um, I think last year we weren't. Um, so you're allowed to this year, you're not required to. So um, it does make the job uh, easier in a lot of ways to be able to knock on doors, to ask permission to um, place traps on people's property. Just it, it increases the selection of good trap sites that we have. So if you do opt to do that, uh, be sure and wear your mask. Um, once you knock on the door with your mask on, so you, you approach the door, knock on it, and then back up six feet um, so that when the person answers the door, um, you're already six feet away. Um, if you hand the, a person at a home or any, anybody out in public, you hand anybody anything, be sure, um, in the, a lot of cases, it's going to be literature like pamphlets and things like that. So be sure to have gloves on to do that. And of course, use hand sanitizer often. Um, that's good general advice as well. So, okay, and moving on, um, what is an ambassador? We say, um, you know, that you're an ambassador. What does that mean? So it's a a person who represents and promotes um, activities on behalf of a larger entity. In our case, it would be the Oregon Department of Agriculture, so our agency. So you guys will all be ODA ambassadors, um, which is really great. It comes with some responsibility as well. So with your work, as I mentioned, like you'll be interacting on a daily basis with members of the public all over. You know, you'll be in residential areas um, near a lot of people's homes and things like that. So it's actually pretty interesting to consider that for a lot of these people that you'll interact with on a face-to-face -face basis, you are likely going to be the only ODA employee that that person maybe ever talks to in person. So that's good to remember because um, we want to um, always remember that we're representing the agency and um, always you want to leave that person with a good impression of the ODA. Um, so with that um, unique kind of situation, some things that we want to consider and that we're going to talk about in this presentation are public perception, public record, and permission and property access, as well as tactics for interacting with the public. As far um, as public record and perception, it's important to realize that everything that you do while you're on state time or using state property like your vehicle is considered to be public record. So that includes um, things on your phone or computer if you have them, text messages, um, emails, also any of your personal conduct while you're on state time, um, your driving um, when you're driving, a, a state vehicle, any any kind of uh, documentation like log sheets, uh, trap cards, and et cetera, just really anything um, can be a matter of public record. 
Important to note that when we say things are public record, it means that if a records request is submitted by the member by a member of the public, that that those um, documents or whatever they may be can be released. But it, we don't mean that just anybody from the public at any time can go and look this stuff up. So there is a process behind it. And I think we'll be notified as well if uh, any public records are be to be released. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, it's important to also remember that your phone is state property and it's up, so it's subject to this um, public records um, um, procedure. So anything that you do on your phone um, can be eventually through a process of uh, access by the public. So you wanna be aware and very, very cautious about using your phone for anything outside of work. Probably best to avoid signing into any private accounts like your bank account or anything like that. Um, it just just better to not do it and not and then just not have to worry about it. So also keep in mind that the public has a really close eye on us, especially if you're driving around in a vehicle that's labeled as Oregon Department of Agriculture, or, um, you know, we always wear clothing to designate us as state employees, you know, so we, we're e e easily visualized by the public um, as such. And, uh, but with that comes some, uh, some people will put you under uh, a magnifying glass as, as such, um, because as state employees, um, our time and any of our equipment is typically um, funded by tax dollars. And so um, tax, the tax paying public has um, a really close interest and in some cases um, can be real quick to um, report any even perceived or in some cases loosely perceived misuse of um, that time and equipment. So just something to be really aware of. Um, to avoid any kind of problems. So now we'll talk about permission and access to private property. So as we talked about, um, in a lot of cases, good trap sites occur on private property. And if we just didn't trap um, in these locations at all, it would um, hamper our uh, good quality pest detection. Obviously, a lot of the landscape is composed of private properties. So we never place a trap on private property without asking permission. But that permission doesn't have to just be written. It can be verbal and it can be from, so if you're talking about a home, it can be from the person who lives there, whether they rent the property and are a tenant or whether they're homeowners it can be um, permission can be granted by a landlord if you're talking about a private business it can be um, the owner of that business or an occupant of that business um, so the when you um, visit a site we'll get into this later you want to, when you visit a site you're going to record a lot of data about that site um, if it's a private property um, like we're talking about and you've gained permission to access it, um, you'll want to include with that data the type of permission that you received, whether it was verbal or written. Um, you probably want to indicate this on your trap card. Again, um, trap cards will be discussed in more detail later on, but just know that it's the um, hard copy, like the paper version of the um, data that, that you'll be recording um, with your trapping activities. So on that card, you'll there's a little box that says, you know, um, type of permission, verbal, written, um, scheduled ahead of time, things like that. So you'll want to indicate the type of permission that you got. Um, it would be really great if you could also list the person's name who gave you permission. Um, in some cases, you may encounter um, a home or a residence where perhaps two people live there, say, for example, like a married couple, and the you, you talk to one person and they say, oh yeah, like 
um, that's fine. Go ahead, put your trap wherever you want, and then maybe you'll come back. And the other person will be there, and this could really just pertain to anybody who's sharing a dwelling. And maybe so you've got a different person there. Person who gave you permission isn't present, and person number two is like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I never gave you permission, and um, you know whatever. But so it's handy to have that name on hand as well to provide um, to anybody that you encounter like that. But it's also you know it's it's good for just record keeping as well, and for um, any other type of reference that we might have. Um, if you can also, if, you know, if it's pertinent, record their phone number, um, that kind of thing. So, and ideally when you go to place a trap on somebody's private property, whether it is a business or a residence, it's ideal if you can find a spot to put the trap that you can just access any time. Um, it's uh, like maybe in their front yard or something like not behind a fence or a gate. Um, it's It makes it quicker and more efficient if you don't have to, you know, contact anybody. If, as long as you set it up ahead of time with them that that's okay, that you're there, um, you know, when they're not, um, if you don't have to walk through their gate or anything like that and just make it really easy to drive up, get to your trap and leave, it's uh, you know, going to be a lot more time efficient. It's not always possible. Um, sometimes you, you will encounter um, having to access their property through some other more complicated means. So in that case, you'd want to talk to them about, you know, uh, if they have a preference for they have to be home when you come or not, you know, if they do or if they want to be contacted ahead of time. Um, if so, how far ahead of time do they need, do you need to call them the day before, a week before, or something like that. Um, so all those things are good to record if pertinent. Um, also, if you do have to access their property in some um, not straightforward way, uh, they or if they have any preference for access points or things like that. So go ahead and um, get that information from them and record it as well. Always keep in mind that even if you remember that you need to go through um, gate A but not gate B to get into their yard, like you might remember that, but it's always possible that somebody else is going to be um, visiting your trap site and not you just for a whole variety of reasons. So always make sure that um, to record this and all the data on your trap card as if um, somebody else might be needing to look at that and figure out how to get to your trap um, most safely and how um, a homeowner uh, or property owner uh, wants you to. So um, just in general, um, in in uh, trapping situations, also just in life, um, it's always just a great rule of thumb to, if you encounter a gate um, to, that you have to walk through, whether it's a livestock gate or somebody's gate to their yard or a garden gate or anything like that, always leave the gate the way you found it. If you find it open, leave it open. <laughs> um, if you find it cl closed, leave it closed. Um, so that's just a good general rule always. Um, you will want to take note, um, and again, it's really preferable if you can indicate this on your trap card written down, if there are any pets to be aware of at this property, most specifically dogs. Um, we have some issues with dogs, you know, of course, from time to time. So, you know, if there's dogs there, they seem friendly to you, um, you know, go ahead and write that down, like friendly dogs, or if they're not friendly, definitely write that down. Um, and maybe avoid <laughs> putting a trap where you have to interact with an unfriendly animal. Um, so also with a lot of your properties uh, or a lot of the, the trap sites that you are going to encounter, particularly agricultural ones, you may see signs up about restricted or no entry periods, um, likely due to pesticide application. So those have um, post-entry intervals uh, that have to do with pesticide safety, and they're specific to the compound that's being applied. Always respect those signs. It doesn't matter if somebody said, oh yeah, like come in my field anytime and check your trap. If you see a sign up that they've put down a pesticide and you're in that post-entry interval, or if it just says don't enter um, because of that, like totally respect that. Um, first, uh, it dominates any kind of other permissions that you may have gotten. And go ahead and get in touch with your point of contact for that site and see when might be 
a good time to schedule another visit on another day. And there are any kind of special requirements to getting to your site, like you're on a logging road, you need a CB radio or something else, um, just uh, be sure and, and note that as well. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about um, trespassing. So what constitutes trespassing? Things that, um, that are trespassing are being on a private property, being asked to leave, and not complying with that. Um, entering through a gate or a fence, <laughs> a scaling a fence, um, that's clearly meant to keep people out, not like a livestock gate, um, not like a gate to somebody's yard, um, like that's obviously not meant, not targeted towards humans um you know if you see a barbed wire strand at the top or something like that of like a not a just cattle fence but something high up that has a strand of barbed wire at, across the top like we're all familiar with what that kind of thing looks like if it's aimed at people and it's really clear to keep people out then like don't go through that gate but other gates is um totally you know fine to just to, to approach somebody's house with um also if you enter a building or a residence without permission, that's trespassing. What isn't trespassing is approaching a home, knocking on a door, a home or a business, knocking on their door, um, being respectful of COVID, COVID protocols, PS, and then um, asking permission to place a trap there for the summer. That is not trespassing. Um, so as long as there's a clear path from a public road to that door um so maybe you have to drive down a private lane or something like that um or walk across somebody's um you know paved pathway or or, or something that they've got you know next to their house um it, that is not trespassing um as long as there's a main and a really clear path to follow from a public road to that front door like you're okay things that you want to avoid are like crossing across people's yards um wandering off of the path like walking up to their house and like you don't want to like stray from the path to like oh like let me i think i see a tree that looks good to hang a trap in let me um peep that really quick and then go to their door like don't do that um just <laughs> get straight out of your vehicle stay on like a mark you know what you can interpret as a marked path or a clear path to their front door knock on the door and then talk to them be sure that it's okay with them that you um look around their property for things like that um so um anyway just to be clear <laughs> that what we what is normal in your job which is just like what approaching somebody's um, home or business and um and having that conversation with them is not in fact trespassing um so uh at the same time though when you're approaching uh, a, a private property of any type uh go ahead and like take in the scene in general like um does it look like they don't want people there? Like, does it look like they're taking a lot of action and going through some effort to deter people from being there? Um, kind of like, do they have really fortified uh, fencing? Do they have a lot of heavy signage that says no trespassing and things like that? Um, if you if you can think about it, like try and ask yourself, like would somebody whose job is a, like a utility worker or a postal service employee who would be coming up to this house, like would they feel uncomfortable or intimidated, um, you know, to to continue on and, and get um, approach this house? Um, you know, that's kind of a good kind of guideline to go by. Um, but if for any reason you kind of, look around and anything about the setting makes you feel uncomfortable um you know feel don't approach the house like don't go on the property go with your gut um if they have like for instance like one like say with signage do they have one sign up that says private property or no trespassing or something like that one or two signs um doesn't necessarily mean like don't go knock on their door like a lot of people have a sign or two up that just generally says like no trespassing 
and you can totally still uh, you know in a lot of cases um that is still totally fine to go up to their door however like do they have them pasted across like do they have 10 signs on a one acre lot that says no trespassing like if they do like maybe maybe reconsider um for example like so say you see this private property like don't hunt fish or anything like that on here like um if i saw this on that tree like i would still absolutely approach that house if that was the only thing that was there however did this gate I would not go through this gate. <laughs> um, th these people obviously don't want visitors. Um, so anyway, just just some things to um, to keep in mind, and um, and again, um, just use your your best judgment on if you if you feel like a certain property is questionable. Absolutely, feel free to pass it on. Uh, just just go on to the next one. Like you'll find another site um, somewhere. So that does it for my section. So I will hand this over to Chantel. You're muted, Chantal. Thank you, Annie. I'm glad I didn't get very far. All right. Thank you, Holly. That was excellent about private property permissions. This next section, we're going to talk a little bit about prearranged permissions on the public right away, some agreements we have with other agencies and entities as, um, as an agency. Um, and um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just dig into it. I'll try to zoom along here. So when we talk about the right of way, um, we are not talking about who goes first at a stop sign. Here we're talking about the public road right of way and the easements on either side of it that encompass the shoulders, sometimes the sidewalks and ditches. Um, on most roads, the public right of way, we're going to calculate that kind of from the center line. And what that's going to look like is most public roadways, the right of way extends 30 feet from the center line on both sides. On older county roads that are maintained by the county, it's usually around 20 feet. But as you can imagine, and as this picture of downtown Portland shows, um, the right of way, there are many exceptions to that rule. So some things that affect the public right of way distance from the center line are if there are bike, bus, and max lanes, um, if there are islands and divided roads. And freeways and highways obviously have, because they're very large, they have their own right-of-way rule. Um, so in this picture, just really quickly for the person who might be doing downtown Portland, um, we have this road here near Pioneer, Pioneer Courthouse Square. Um, because the city of Portland owns and maintains most of this, it's, it would be okay, let's say, to place an, <clears throat> excuse me, an AGM trap in this tree here. Um, this would be considered in this particular instance part of the right-of-way even though it's on the sidewalk we'll talk a little bit more about residential right-of-ways and what that might look like um, but in this particular instance that would be okay so a little exercise anyone want to take a guess at i don't the picture doesn't go all the way across but anyone want to take a guess at the where the right-of-way kind of starts here I don't have a ton of time, so I'll just I'll just keep going. So the right of way would extend, at least for our access, and because obviously we're not going to put a trap in the middle of a concrete sidewalk. Um, so for our purposes, the right of way would include this grass strip between the roadway and the sidewalk. I do want to mention that you know, and I think this is also stated on another slide that homeowners mostly, by and large, maintain this strip. Some people decorate it beautifully. Some people just mow the lawn. So if we do place a trap here, we're not gonna stick it in the middle of the grass. We might stick it next to this pole so that it's out of the way of the mower. Um, we don't wanna be annoying to people who have to maintain this even though we have access to it without permission. Um, now, if I did see, like if this person was getting out of their car when I went to go place this trap, I would definitely say hello and maybe explain what I'm doing. Um, even though they don't technically like I technically don't need permission here, I might still just let them know what I'm doing. And if they said, oh no, that's ugly, I don't want it there, I would definitely remove it. 
Um, so even though we have access to this area without permission, if this person were to call and say, I hate that, get that out of the front of my house, we would definitely go remove it and move it away from their house. Um, so we try to be as courteous as possible and mindful of, of people, even if we have that inherent permission there. So this is another example of a road with a right of way. And for sake of time, I'll just show you. Power poles are a great, are power poles and fence lines. So when people put a fence on their on their rural property, I try to use, I mostly use this as their indication of where they think their property ends and where the right of way begins. So I would totally feel comfortable placing a trap along this fence um, or on this power pole. Um, or anywhere over here next to this utility box. Utility boxes are also going to be in the right of way. Um, and any like USPS owned mailboxes. So not like this person's private mailbox, but any um, a lot of new home developments have USPS owned boxes that everyone kind of comes to. And there's like 40 mailboxes in one unit. Um, so those ones um, are typically in, a, in an easement as well. Anyone want to take a stab, this one, hopefully, at where the right-of-way is on a private road? There is no private road right-of-way. So if you see on some street signs, it'll say, like, um, Deer Park PVT DR, which means it's a private driveway. There isn't a right-of-way on there. So even if this tree looks great and even if there's a fence right here, you're in someone's private property at that point. Um, so we would not place traps without any permission down a private drive. Sometimes it's not obvious. So if you accidentally place a trap down someone's private driveway you thought was owned and maintained by the city or, or state, um, and then they asked us to remove them, we would definitely go pretty much in any case, even with prearranged permissions. If anyone asks us to remove or move a trap, we would definitely go do that. Um, but it does happen on occasion. We don't realize we're on someone's private drive. I'm sorry I mentioned this a little bit, but some tips to locating the right of way are you'll see telephone poles in the right of way, there will be road signage, power boxes, and the land strip like this picture shows between the street and the sidewalk. I wanted to bring this up because here's a rose bush. This is a great, this is actually a Google image from somewhere in southeast Portland. This would be a great site to host a Japanese beetle trap. It's got a rose, we can place you know it 10 feet away, and it would be a fantastic site. However, it is someone's like very well maintained right of way strip. Um, so you could put it there without permission. That is allowable, but we wouldn't want to put it like right in the middle of the walkway or, or something. Um, let's see, I'm going to mute someone really quickly. And So we just want to be careful that we don't, um, okay, never mind, got it, um, that we don't interfere with what they're doing here. Some people are really sensitive about their right away. Um, so we don't, you know, if they were outside or I might even, because we're allowed to knock on doors this season, walk up to this house, and even though this is a right away and I don't need permission, just go up there and be like, hey, you have this great little rose bush here and I want to put a trap out. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to approach and what to say in the next section here. But um, anyway, just something to consider. Not that you can't put it here, but just we try to be as courteous as possible. So in terms of prearranged permissions, we have a lot of prearranged permission that we work through our director's office and the field coordinator staff for um, most state parks. And the reason I say most is that this season there was a lot of ice damage and there's been fire damage and par parts of parks that are closed for dangerous situations. And we definitely respect that. State parks gave us permission to place traps in their parks. Once we reach out to um, the land manager to make sure we can safely access the site. Um, so you'll get those of you 
um, at PFO, we'll get a copy of that permit so you can see what that is. We also are required to carry that permit with us whenever we enter state park property. Um, so in case you have a state park that you're putting traps at, that's definitely one reason. Normally, if there wasn't safety concerns and everything was open, we would probably have permission to almost all state parks, but this season it's a little unique. Um, we have permission for most local, county, and municipal parks. Um, sometimes there's permits and training required for, for Portland Field Office. We have Forest Park, it's a very large park with a lot of access gates that we need a special training to access. So sometimes there are things like that that we have to do. Um, some federal properties, um, sometimes it doesn't include things like national wildlife refuges, just because those are really sensitive habitats. Um, and so that would be a unique situation where we might not have um, access to the like wetland area of a wildlife refuge. Um, but um, we do get access to like Crater Lake and areas like that through permits. Um, and then we also have access to some utility easements. And so when you're when we're talking about prearranged permissions, just because we have this through our director's office where the director of ODA is talking to the director of someone at, at a high level state park position, that doesn't mean that the local hosts or park office knows anything about what we're doing. So if we have a park office or a host situation like Camp Host, um, we, we will always pretty much interact with them if we can, as long as the office is open. Um, we can also call staff. Um, usually their contact information for like Silver Falls State Park is online, so we can reach out via phone too. We introduce ourselves in the program, and then we notice we notify what we we'll use something called informing consent typically when we have prearranged permission about like, hi, this is what we do, this is the trap, this is what I need in terms of site location, and then we ask for their guidance on trap placement. A lot of campgrounds the last two seasons have been doing a lot of excavating and, and regrading work. I mean, we definitely don't want to put a trap right where they're trying to do that kind of work. Um, so we definitely ask for guidance on trap placement, especially if they're felling trees in the camp or something like that. We don't want to hang a gypsy moth trap on a tree that's going to go away. Um, so we definitely ask for guidance on that. Most people are very, you know, friendly and they love to talk to you. Sometimes we've even posted our flyers on their like kiosks at, at parks and stuff. Um, and it's been a really nice experience. Plus it gets, you know, this also gives you contacts for later too. So if you're introducing yourself to park managers and then a, a job opens at Silver Falls State Park, you already know the manager. So this is great for you to also keep in mind for, um, for future job positions as well. And if you're ever unsure if we have prearranged permissions in an area, just feel free to reach out to your coordinator to clarify. So um, Holly mentioned a little bit about some ODA pamphlets and letters that we have, um, and it answers most of the general questions about pest species that the public will have. I know that none of these pamphlets are inside your binders right now, um, but please feel free that when you get your, to your field office to grab these materials and read through them. Even though you read this, this still doesn't mean that you need to be anybody's expert on Japanese beetle. Um, so feel free to say, hey, you know, this will tell you all about Japanese beetle on the back. There's contact information if you want to reach out to our entomology lab and learn more about it. Or if you have specific questions, we can always let the experts answer some of those more complicated questions. Um, they can be handed out or left at doorsteps. We also have someone mentioned, I think, in the chat box, something about right away letters. Um, I don't have an example of that here, but you'll definitely see those at the field office. Right away letters explain the trap. So if you do leave something in the right away, you can, like they explain the trap, that it's non-toxic, that it has a, you know, a pheromone or please don't mess with it even though it's non-toxic. And, and then you can also include your personal work cell phone number on there and your name and leave that at the door. So that picture a couple slides back of that beautifully maintained right away space. If I were to leave a trap there because I didn't have a chance to talk on the door or if no one was home, I could leave that letter at their doorstep 
and say, you know, if you want me to move this or if you don't like it, you know, you know, just or whatever, and just letting them know what what that trap is and why it's there. Um, a lot of times people are very supportive, um, but every once in a while we do get people who are really like they really are passionate about the right of way, even right of ways that aren't even in front of their house. It might be two miles away and they're just so passionate about it. <laughs> they don't like looking at some of our traps sometimes. Um, but um, most importantly, you want to make sure that, you know, don't put these letters or information inside someone's mailbox. Um, it's against the federal law to for a post person to put anything inside of someone's mailbox or anyone that's not a post person to put things inside of a mailbox. So don't do that. So the last thing I have is just an exercise, but for sake of time, I just want you to think about this. We can come back to this maybe um, during our, out, our um, breakout session later, but there are definitely benefits and drawbacks to placing traps on private property versus the right of way. Um, and if we have some chance, maybe in the breakout, I can pull this slide back up and we can chat about it. So think about it a little bit, um, but I will pass it off to Haley so that we can get you hopefully to lunch on time. <laughs> Any questions, I guess, before I pass it off to her? Let me check the chat. I had a question real quick. Sure. Um, I am in the treatment area in the um, quarantine um, yard debris area, and I noticed this year on the um, uh, to treat, there uh -huh. was a spot there to give permission to place traps. Yeah, that's new this year, right? It is new. I wasn't sure if we'd and, be able to um, knock on doors. So go ahead. Sorry, I didn't realize you weren't done. <laughs> go ahead, Jenny Lee. Um, that's information we can use on uh, explore or something to place traps there, or I guess maybe it like um, tees us up for a conversation with them. Yeah, so it totally is something um, for those of you that will have territory in the eradication areas next Wednesday, after you guys wrap up field training, I'm actually gonna pull you all to talk more about that. So because it only affects a handful of you, I was gonna pull you guys all aside as a little group to talk more about what that looks like this season. So good Sounds question. Good. Thank you. Hang on to that thought. <laughs> okay, all oh, yours, Haley. Okay, I was about to ask. Um, so when you're knocking on doors and talking to the public about setting these traps, it's really good to be prepared and have an elevator pitch. Um, the general idea of an elevator pitch is you should be able to sell someone on something within the time that it takes to take an elevator ride. So be prepared and have what you're going to say ready. And so be ready. Um, and with COVID also to be professional, have your face mask and your gloves and your credentials. It's also always good to approach people with what you want to put in their yard. So I usually go to the door with my trap, with a pamphlet ready, um, and also usually like my trap card in case I need to write any notes right there. Because um, if someone has something particular about their yard, they do like to see that those details are written down. Um, and then always walk on clear pathways. People are particular about their lawns and landscaping, and it just, once again, looking professional is very important. Um, as before, gates, leave them how you found them. Um, rural park properties, uh, once again, clear pathways, and park with the intention to leave in case someone doesn't like that you're a state employee on their property. You don't want to be uh, pulling in Austin Powers, trying to turn around while they're shaking their fist at you. Um, so, um, with COVID, once you knock on the door, you want to back up and give that person space. You don't want to crowd them. It's also important to sort of angle your body. You don't want them feeling cornered in. It's just, um, in an intimidating feeling to feel like blocked in by people. So just angling yourself a little bit, um, 
to give yourself more of a non-threatening posture is very important. Um, usually with, in normal times, uh, the, the people that are home in the middle of the day are often elderly, but with COVID, that's a little bit different. But with face masks and reduced social cues, it's important to speak loudly and clearly so people don't uh, need to ask you to repeat yourself or um, you lose any time repeating yourself. Um, even if someone's rude to you, it's always important to uh, be polite and courteous um, if, if they're not and courteous you can always remove yourself from that situation or find a way to de-escalate that's that's the most important thing to do um if they seem sketched out or there's a pause in the conversation that's a great time to give them the flyer and be like hey do you know what like if you have any questions or if you want to know more i have this information i can answer some of those questions but there's contact information on the back that'll get you in touch with entomologists and other really handy info a lot of uh people's main concerns are about the lures themselves they're like well, are there chemicals or like is this going to be dangerous for my dog or my kids and so is you can tell them it's a pheromone it is not a chemical also it's uh rose scented so it's also not a chemical it's just uh non-toxic not dangerous uh if if pets do get to it you know that's that's not the best thing but they won't need to go to the vet or anything like that and sorry just checking that chat um why is this giving trouble sorry one second there we go so um here is an example of an eleva elevator pitch so once you go and knock on someone's door and they answer and so you're not stuck there with like oh my god there's a there's a live one what do i say uh hi my name is Haley. i'm with the oregon department of agriculture's insect pest prevention and management program every year we survey for invasive insects insect pests across the state of oregon may i place this japanese beetle trap near your rose bushes for the summer i will be back to check the trap a couple of times and we'll remove it in october so showing the trap reduces intimidation um, and lets them know. It's also good to already have a place in their yard that you're planning to ask about. So that way, if they're like, well, I don't want it visible or like, what are you gonna do with it? It's, it's good to be prepared and have suggestions of where you want to access. Um, and also let them know like, I will be back. This will remain here for this amount of time and it will be removed. It, um reduces the amount of questions that they'll have for you um informing consent chantelle went over this um and it's it's the same thing so you guys are okay with it i think maybe we don't need to go over this again Ooh, Annie, good question. Um, so when people ask, they're like, well, it's an invasive species. Is, is that trap going to attract them to my yard? It's important to explain that if, if one does end up in the trap, it means that those species are already in their yard or would be in their yard if we didn't find them. And so that's why we're doing this survey is so that we can find them and treat for them. It, it, it won't be adding bad insects to their yard that aren't already there. Um, and so now we're into the exercise. Uh, Chantel, did we want to do this as a large group thing? Um, they have about 
nine minutes before they're supposed to be on lunch, we might be able to do it during the breakout session um, okay. instead. That would be okay. But essentially, this is great to have, especially if you're cold calling. I think one season I started out doing fruit fly survey, which is where you have to do some cold calls to ag land owners. And I was just totally tongue tied um, because, because I hadn't thought through my elevator pitch for that season. It had been a whole six months since the last time I did something. So having this really helps you a lot, especially when you're first walking up to people. And if you don't get it the first couple of times, eventually you'll have talked to enough people through the season. You will eventually feel more confident and comfortable. Um, but I definitely recommend building one. Oh, Liz, um, do you mean someone besides the property owner removes it? No, um, say you get permission from the property owner and then you go back a week later and say someone in his family is like, I don't want this on my property or the guy or woman changes their mind, uh, do we then place it in another place? But somebody, um, Haley already answered the question for me that we would yeah, find uh, a different, different place. Yeah, to, thank you. I wanted to make sure I read that right. Yeah, that's, yeah. Because, I mean, would you put it back in the same place if the same thing's going to happen or just look for, you know, like a close, the closest to that place? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's also, also have a nice tag with the ODA contact information and it says contact us. Like it asks them to reach out to us to remove it if they have a problem. Like it's pretty clear tag too so usually they call amanda's very good about asking if they can su supply the barcode or trap number from the bottom and then we just reach out to the coordinator and whoever's trap it is it goes and gets moved and the public feels like they really were served very well they called they asked for something and we said sure thing so it usually goes really smooth there are a couple instances where you might replace a trap that um, like, for example, if you're putting a trap on a telephone pole and it's a really windy area out in the middle of ag land or something, and you don't suspect someone stole your trap necessarily, but that it just went missing, you can replace it once, you know, and if it went missing again, then maybe we need to find a new home for it. Um, there's another situation on right away spaces. So um, back on that picture where it was um, like two road, uh, you know, two lane roads with like just grass strips. Sometimes people who mow their lawn, they accidentally mow our trap. Um, or if they're brush clearing along a ditch drainage um, and you hung your trap, you know, on the side that they're clearing trees out and stuff, your trap might disappear. Um, but um, generally af after that happens, they're not going to come do that again. <laughs> So you can probably put your trap back out. But we do try, if you're using right-of-way spaces on drainage ditches nearby, to put the trap like on the side of the tree, not on like on the side that's not facing the roadway. So that way when they do their brush clearing, they are less likely to cut your trap down. Um, sometimes utility workers are really nice and they take our traps and put them back on the tree. And sometimes they just take everything and just you know, take it all to landfill. Um, so just something to keep in mind too with right away space. Kaylee, did you want to do the um, role playing exercise? Oh, yes. <laughs> I almost forgot about that. Uh, so who wants to be who? Oh, I don't know. I guess we don't need, you don't need to screen share, I guess, but these are the most common personalities you might see. That way they can see us better. Maybe that would work better for yeah. them. Um, agreeable, angry or upset. Most people are agreeable. Mm -hmm. Most people are very supportive of what we do, or they just don't really 
they don't necessarily care. <laughs> um, and then angry or upset and difficult, long-winded. So um, I can be the person or the trapper. I'm okay being either. Um, and I think hey, Hall, or sorry, Haley Holly. I think Holly also can play along either way too. Yeah, yeah, I'm good with whatever. Um, I mean, Chantel, do you want to be an agreeable person, and we'll start sure. there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so hi there. My name is Haley. I'm with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. I'm out doing an insect survey, and I was hoping I could use that little part in your yard over there for the summer. Uh, I'm just going to be putting this there. It has a little lure in it. Um, I'll come back a couple times, or someone dressed like me will come back a couple times to check it out, and we'll have it out of your way by October. Sure. Are you talking about that area over there where my daffodils are, or my my pumpkins, we'll say, my pumpkins and squash are planted, that area over there? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I'll make sure I'll keep them out of the way of any landscaping so I uh, don't interrupt your activities. Now, because I have edible plants over there, is it toxic? Is it going to affect my plants? No, not at all. It's just a scented pheromone lure, so there's no toxic worries there. Yeah, that's totally fine. I don't mind. I guess, how long does it stay out? So I would be back uh, usually September to October uh, to pick it up. And you don't have to do anything with it other than let it be. Sure, that's fine. Cool, thank you so much. And if you want some more information on this, I can just give this to you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay do me do me <laughs> <laughs> okay so are you gonna be uh angry or upset i'll, I'll do the difficult one I'll, okay I'll okay cool uh hi there my name is Haley. i'm with the oregon department of agriculture i'm out doing a survey for invasive species specifically the japanese beetle I was hoping I could play th place this in your yard until October. Uh, would hmm. that be okay with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think that'll, I think that'll be okay. Um, um, so you're catching, you're looking for a beetle. Is that, is that right? Do what does it, what does it look like? I caught a beetle in my yard, um, like a last week, and I wonder if it's what you were looking for i mean i um i killed it and i threw it away but um like let's go see do you think like you want to come over with me i bet there's one just like it like over here like do you want to like like come here i think i think i found what you're out looking for and i think we could save you a lot of trouble with putting up this trap if you just like come over and, and like let's just find it again I really appreciate your enthusiasm. I do have a lot of these to put out, but I do have this brochure. It has a picture of the beetle on the front. Also contact information on the back. So if you do find that beetle again, uh, you can take a picture or capture it in a little jar and uh, get that information over to our entomologist and they can give you more information on that. As for oh. now though, Okay, okay. I mean, that's cool. That's cool. That's great. Um, you know what, though? Also, my aunt sent me this picture of like an insect that she found in her yard, like it's in North Carolina. But I just wonder, like you work with bugs, like, hold on, you're like, let me pull this up real quick. I, I like what if what if like, what do you think this is? So like, I'm gonna tell you, I, I'm, I usually, I'm the boots on the ground. I'm just setting the traps once again. Uh, oh. There's some contact information to entomologists, but I'm, I'm just gonna oh. get this set, and then uh, I hope you have a, oh. have a great day. Wait, 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 wait. Before you, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm, yeah, I'm so sorry. But like, what should I do in general, like, to keep all of these types of invasive insects like out of my yard? Um, like, also, I've had this trouble with like spiders coming in my house like what should I do for that also like how can I keep Japanese beetles and spiders off my property you know I think there's some good google searches uh that you could do for that one I'm I, I'm you know I only know so much I really wish I could help you more okay, but yeah. for now thank you so much uh have a great day I'm gonna get moving on to the rest of my work thank you all right thank you <laughs>
That one's always fun. Most of the time they do talk a lot about their family. Uh, some um, older people, they haven't seen people in a while. Um, and they're really, really fun to chat with. But man, sometimes <laughs> they, they could be uh, a long winded sometimes. Um, I've seen some really cool rock collections, but it's still like, hey man, like I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then angry, or angry and upset, I think you could probably either they don't answer the door at all or they're yelling at you or talking to you about how they hate state government or federal government or how they're upset that there's an eradication happening where you're trying to set traps or, you know, anything like that. Um, we just try to be as courteous as possible. I don't think we need to go through that one um, because we are cutting a little bit into the, the lunchtime. Um, I, don't worry, you'll still get 30 minutes lunch. I just, um, anyway, so, and then there's have been instances, it's not, it's very infrequent where people have encountered people out maybe doing varmint hunting on their property. So they're going to approach somebody, um, to set a trap and they have a shotgun <laughs> or a rifle in their hands. Um, and that can be a little intimidating, right? We don't, obviously want to put you in any dangerous situation like that, but it is, is usually very infrequent that that something like that would ever happen. Um, but if they're angry or upset, just say thank you and move on um, is probably the best recourse for that um, situation. I have, I have a question about dealing with dogs um, as a landscaper and a farmer um, and uh, working for the USDA before I've been, I've been attacked by a lot of dogs. Because um, anytime, as you know, when you're going on on someone else's property and you're a stranger and you're wearing a funny hat, you're touching things. Um, dogs are are always going to come after you. So does does anyone have any specific advice or tools? Is is there like um, a protocol for dealing with animals that are attacking you, or some kind of protection we can use? Yeah, I think I think there might be a slide in this set at the end that talks a little bit about dog bites, if I remember correctly, Haley. Um, but dogs in general, yeah. So it seems like every year we have someone who has an encounter with dogs. One reason why we have you um, uh, wear long pants and closed-toed shoes. Um, obviously, we don't want you to be bit. Um, and then we do have dog treats that we can give you like hypoallergenic dog treats that we can give to you to distract a dog. But sometimes a dog has intentions to bite you is not going to care about a treat. Um, in any case, if you do become, if you do get bit by a dog um, and it breaks the skin, even if it doesn't like rip your clothes or anything, you have to seek medical attention for the dog bite. Um, and that would be via a worker's compensation claim and you would want to notify Jake or Annie of that incident. There's some reporting on Workday that you would have to do. Um, and Jenny Lee, to answer your question, I, I mean, I know I really am the kind of person who wants to pet dogs too. Like I like dogs more than I like other people. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I just with COVID and stuff and being mindful of people who might have immunocompromised situations. I know that it's really unlikely a dog would pass COVID-19 to their owner or to you, um, but probably just best to avoid that unless you explicitly ask the person and they say that's okay. And I mean, unless Annie has a better <laughs> answer for that. No, I just was going to say that's exactly how the director's office is viewing things right now. They want us to operate as though, you know, most counties are still, uh, very high risk areas for COVID. Um, there kind of has been, you know, those spikes going in areas. So our agency is operating very heavily, just like we did last year in mindset. They're just trying to relax a little bit on allowing that opportunity to try to talk to the public a little bit more than we did last year. So yeah, Chantal, you nailed it perfectly. If we can avoid petting pets, um, we should. If it's a unique situation and you have the owner's permission, that might make sense. But just case by case. 
I'm also the person who pets horses and goats. I had a goat try to eat my trapper vest one season. Um, I really am <laughs> that person who wants to touch all the animals. Um, so I feel you there. Um, but yeah, it's unfortunate. I don't, I know you're wanting to break for lunch really soon. I just wanted to throw in a comment here for all of you. I do have an email that for this afternoon at 2.15 when we have our iLearn training, um, Lee has emailed all of you. Um, and I'm gonna read some names where it went to your ODA email because you have one already. That would be Ellen, Emily, Jenilee, Aralia, Alyssa, and Michael. Everybody else, it's gone to your personal email, which looks like a whole lot of Gmails and a couple others sprinkled in there. So.